All right, well, hey everybody. Um, today I'm gonna do the last lecture of the whole course that has new content. Uh, so this is the last lecture before the final exam review. So you've made it to the end of the course um, and we're gonna continue our discussion of quantum mechanics. So pat yourself on the back, you did it. Um, and this is a really, this is gonna be a really interesting lecture. So just hold on tight. Uh, it's gonna get, it's gonna get a little bit weird. Um, first we're gonna talk about the uncertainty principle and uh, which is it's going to take a couple of slides but just hold on tight hear me out and we'll we'll get there before too long all right so we talked about plane waves a couple lectures back um, so plane waves are a kind of a sine wave and uh, this is a good example of like a laser so a laser operates at a specific uh, frequency um, so this is what i would call a, a continuous wave laser and that it just it's always on it's never off um, it's not a pulse, um, it's just operating at a very specific frequency. Um, so the people that do gravity wave research, they, they are very interested in these kinds of lasers. Uh, my friends at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, they're very interested in these kinds of uh, lasers, which produce pulses. And so the, you know, the intensity, the electric field uh, comes to sort of a peak. And what's interesting is that you know this is sort of a short duration kind of a pulse and in terms of the frequencies well this is a specific frequency one specific frequency whereas this turns out it has to be a distribution of frequencies there still can be a center frequency but there has to be multiple different frequencies of light that uh, ultimately would produce this kind of a pulse um, and we talked earlier about how the energy of the photons relate to the frequency things like that um, but in any case, this is a distribution of frequencies around some center frequency, whereas this is exactly one frequency. Um, you can say similar things about electrons and that electrons, you can uh, make kind of wave-like patterns like this. So you can, it, it is possible to create an electron beam that has electrons that are very much at one exact energy. Um, but uh, electrons can also travel in these sort of uh, packets or pulses uh, that kind of look like this. And so again, this is one energy, um, but this is, uh, this electron would have to have a distribution of electron energies. And because the electrons are not moving at the speed of light, like light is, um, that means that this is a distribution of velocities. Um, so now it starts to get weird. Um, which is that uh, electrons have both particle aspects and wave aspects. And so one of the, something that's true about electrons is that you could say that they are probability waves. And so if this is some sort of electron wave, um, we call this the wave function. So you'll hear about that in the book if you read the book. Um, this is the wave function and the likelihood that an electron will be in a particular place has to do with the square of this wave function. So here the amplitude is nice and large. Um, so the, the electron's fairly likely to be here, fairly likely to be here, here and here, but where the wave function is close to zero, if you guys can see that, where it's close to zero, uh, the electron is very unlikely to be there. So like right here, uh, right here, not very likely to be there. Not impossible, but not incredibly likely either. Um, so what really matters is the square of this uh, wave function, for, which tells us how likely the electron is, is going to be there or not. So let's say that there's some sort of a kind of a pulse or packet or um, some sort of chunk of electrons that is moving and you just want to do a simple experiment. What you're going to do is you're going to send these electrons going uh, this, uh, going, sorry, this way. You're going to send these electrons this way and it's going to go, it's going to hit the wall and you want to do a stopwatch uh, of at what time does it hit the wall. And you already know how much time it takes the light to get from the wall to here. And so as long as you can see the sensor, that tells you that the electron has hit the wall. And so you do this experiment and you do it again and again and again. Uh, and what's interesting is that you will find that uh, you don't get exactly the same velocity each time. And the reason that you don't get the same velocity each time is because the electron is a kind of a particle wave. And when you go to, to see where it is, sometimes the electron will show up on this side of the pulse. Um, sometimes the electron will show up on that side of the pulse. Um, 
and it's really 50-50 which, which side of it it's going to be. And so there's this sort of, the electron is going to be somewhere in here, and so if you time it, if you say, all right, well, the electron's going to go over this way, and I'm going to do a stopwatch when it hits the wall, if you do that, then this uncertainty in the position is going to become an uncertainty in your ability to uh, measure the velocity because you, you know the distance from here to the wall. Um, all you're trying to do is measure the time so you can figure out what the velocity is. But because the electron sometimes arrives earlier and sometimes arrives later, you're going to find that there is some uncertainty in this velocity. You say, all right, well, that's fine, Chris. Well, that's, that's interesting, but let's, let's try to fix this. So let's uh, try to make uh, the electron that we're talking about, let's try to make it from a smaller range of energies. Uh, which will make it have a smaller range of velocities and maybe that will help uh, us make this measurement so that it's one specific velocity and we'll try to set it up and you know set it loose that way and see how long it takes to get over to that wall well that doesn't help because as we talked about uh, with the earlier slides if the electron just has one energy well then it it's suddenly it's it's very extended now and it goes off and off and off it's not like this packet anymore uh, it's not very localized. You can say, all right, well, so trying to make it one, en one energy in order to make it one velocity is, is not very useful. Well, let's try to squeeze it. Um, so let's try to squeeze it together. Um, and then we do the whole experiment again, because if it's smaller, then I should have less uncertainty with that timing. Um, but what happens is if you try to squeeze this together, it, this forces it to have a broader distribution of velocities in it. And that, uh, in turn, gives you even more uncertainty in, in the velocities when you measure. Again, all you're trying to do is measure um, how long does it take to go from here to that wall, stopwatch, that's it. Um, so no matter what you do, it ends up being, you end up getting a slightly different number for the velocity each time that you do it. Each time that you do this experiment, you get some range of velocities. Now. This is what's called the uncertainty principle, what, I just, what I've just described to you. Um, and the thing that people say about it that is not quite right is that the uncertainty principle arises because when we go to measure this electron, like when it's getting to the wall, well, the only way to measure electron is to sort of bounce a photon off of it. And because that photon you know, changes the trajectory of the electron, that photon uh, has introduced some amount of uncertainty into the system and so it's that interaction with something that causes this thing to be uncertain um, and that is not quite true and, and the analogy that I can make is that you know when you go and you measure the uh, pressure in a car tire the only way you can measure the pressure in the car tire unless it has a sensor inside of it um, the only way to measure that is to go over to the valve and sort of let a little bit of air out and depending on how quickly that air comes out and how much force is exerted when the air comes out, there's a little sensor there that can, that, can, uh, that can tell you exactly how much pressure was inside of it. And you could say that because we've left, that because we've allowed air to leave that tire, that we've created this uncertainty in the pressure. Like we measured the pressure, but we know that the pressure was actually a little bit more than that before we measured it. And so you could say, well, that's our uncertainty in the measurement. Well, no, there's, if we really had to, we could sort of try to back out exactly what this pressure was before we measured it. So let's, let's say that we want to know what the pressure was in uh, fighter jet tires before it landed, and so we're going to measure that pressure afterwards. Um, well, we can back out what, uh, what that pressure was, or what, what was the pressure right after it landed. We could back out what that pressure was in spite of the fact that air got out. That's not something that's, it's, it's not impossible to, to try to, uh, take all the information we have and, and try to make the best estimate we can, that we can. And so, so the problem with, the, uh, with this uncertainty principle as you know, photon interaction idea is that it's just not weird enough. Um, again, the, the reason that the position is uncertain is not because a photon interacted with it, but it's because the electrons are these probability waves that sort of show up depending on what the wave function is. And so in, in that sense, it, it's intrinsically unpredictable. It's not just, <clears throat> if it was literally billiard balls and, you know, one billiard ball hits the other billiard ball, we could sort of back out like what the original billiard ball was doing based on 
you know how, what the collision was so it's it's not at all like that the again the electrons are probability waves and that that is ultimately why the uncertainty principle happens so i think i said these things in words already um so this is the equation that uh that gives us the uncertainty principle um which we'll talk about in just a second it says that in any system, the uncertainty in the position times the mass of whatever particle you're talking about times the uncertainty velocity has to be greater than or equal to uh, Planck's constant divided by four pi. Now Planck's constant is very small, which means that for all practical circumstances, the uncertainty in your system is almost certainly going to be larger than this because if you're doing any kind of engineering work with something that's this big, right, your uncertainty is gonna be like a micron or something you know something that to compare to this is going to be very very large and so you're not even gonna to have to worry about this so again the thing and uh, so thankfully this is a very small number so which is why we only talk about it in the very last lecture of a two semester long <laughs> physics course um, this is uh, this was developed by a physicist named uh, Werner Heisenberg um, and so he was a German physicist. An interesting story about him is that he worked on the Nazi effort to uh, build an atomic bomb on the Nazi side. Thankfully, it did not succeed. Um, there's some interesting stuff in, in a play about Heisenberg, and there's some speculation whether he intentionally failed or whether he just was under-resourced. Anyway, there's a bunch of interesting stuff uh, around Heisenberg that you're welcome to look into. Um, so let's try to use this for something practical. I've been teaching at OSU Marion since uh, 2014. I've gotten, I think, one speeding ticket in that time. But let's see if we can use quantum physics to, to get out of a speeding ticket. So let's say that I, I get caught. So, all right, so this is our, so this is the uncertainty principle. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to swap out this inequality and instead I'm gonna make it equal, I'm gonna say, well, this is, this is at best our ability to know the uncertainty and the velocity. So there's some sort of police uh, radar gun, LIDAR gun, whatever you want to call it. It's going to bounce a signal off of my car and depending on the Doppler shift, it will, it will say uh, what speed I was going. Um, but there is some uncertainty in the speed because, uh, because things are both particles and waves. There is some uh, it's not just electrons that have a wave nature. Um, protons have a wave nature. Uh, neutrons have a wave nature. Everything has a wave nature. And so this equation applies for everything, not just uh, electrons. So I'm going to apply it to my car. I'm going to say, all right, well, um, so if my car is probably about 1,000 kilograms, um, the size of my car might be 5 meters, and then Planck's constant is on the top there. Um, if you do that, well, 10 to the minus 34 is pretty big, and so you end up with some vanishingly small miles per hour. Um, an interesting exercise is to go through this thing, and if you, if you replace, you know, the 1,000 kilogram mass of the car with something like uh, the mass of a proton, which would be close to 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, you know, this, this number gets a lot bigger by a factor of 10 to the 27 or, I don't know, 10 to the 30 or something. But it still is, is less than a meter per second. And you can even say, well, five meters is sort of large for the uncertainty of the car. We know that the signal is bouncing off of, say, the hood of the car. And the hood of the car probably has some thickness that might be a millimeter or a centimeter, something like that. Even if you put that in there, at the end of the day, this, this uh, Planck's constant is so darn small that the uncertainty in your, your velocity, because of the uncertainty principle, which again is because of the the wave nature of your car uh, is so small that it just would it would never get you out of a speeding ticket unless of course you get a ticket for going you know 10 to the minus 38 miles per hour over the speed limit then maybe it would I don't know um, so for all practical purposes it's not so useful but for electrons if you put in the mass of an electron there suddenly it's quite large you know for an electron that is confined into an atom that might be a nanometer in size or half nanometer in size, something like that, um, this uncertainty velocity becomes very large. Um, and in fact, uh, in heavier atoms uh, that have more uh, protons in the nucleus, 
um, it turns out that this velocity it gets starts to approach the speed of light interestingly enough so for electrons this becomes a, a very large effect um, so I've been saying that electrons are waves but I haven't told you how to calculate the wavelength of it yet so let me give you that equation so this is what's called uh, the de Broglie wavelength and before I give you that equation I have to tell you what in the world it means so for example is this the whole wavelength of the electron that we're talking about like this scale or is it something else um, well it turns out that it's it's really the peak to peak still right so so we have so this is our wavelength that I'm going to give you um, whereas, I mean, this is still the size of the, the packet, but the wavelength of the, the electron in this case is, is that. So the wavelength is Planck's constant divided by P. P is the momentum of the electron. The momentum of the electron is just from physics 1250, so the mass times the velocity. So there you go. So that's the wavelength of the electron. Um, now, you may need to go from kinetic energy to wavelength at some point. So what I might do on the final, I might tell you, oh, there's an electron of a certain wavelength. Uh, sorry, there's electron of a certain wavelength. What was the kinetic energy? Or there's electron of certain kinetic energy. What is the wavelength? Um, so here's how you do that. Um, so the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, like it is always. Um, and then uh, our velocity is related to our momentum. Right, so P equals mv, like this. So I can solve for the velocity, v equals P over m. I can take this velocity, I can sub it into here. And then uh, I get a P squared, and then m divided by m squared is just 1 over m. So I end up with something like this. Um, and now uh, we know that uh, P is equal to the wavelength, right? So the wavelength is h over P, which means P is h over the wavelength. So I can use this and sub that into there to get this. And now again, our goal is to try to solve for the wavelength in terms of the kinetic energy. So I can multiply both sides by wavelength squared, divide both sides by the kinetic energy to get uh, this, right? And then all I have to do is take the square root and I get uh, this thing here, okay? Um, so there you go. So that's how you get the wavelength of uh, an electron if all I give you is the kinetic energy. So let me give you an example problem here. So let's say that you have an electron that is 5 eV of energy. That's a really nice unit because if, if all I had was a 5 volt potential that I attached two charged plates to and I used that to accelerate an electron, um, that electron would have 5 eV of kinetic energy. And it's not so hard to create 5 volts and it's not so hard to find electrons. So it's it's not so hard to accelerate electrons to 5 eV of kinetic energy. So to figure out what the wavelength would be, um, the way I would do it would be to uh, convert this to joules, perhaps. Um, so 1 eV is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Um, and then you stick that into there. Remember the mass of the electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. That number will be on the equation sheet for the final, don't worry. And then you work all this out. Well, there's a lot of negatives up here and negatives down there. Um, and if you work it all out, you find that this is 5.5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Now, here's a good question. What is this in terms of nanometers? Don't say 55. <laughs> so one meter is 1 billion nanometers. And so if you multiply this by a billion, which is 10 to the 9, that gives you 5.5 times 10 to the minus one, which means 0.55 nanometers. Um, so make sure that you can, you can do that. Um, now, this is a nice number because uh, in microscopes, when people use microscopes to look inside of cells and things like that, um, the resolution of your microscope is limited by the wavelength of the whatever waves that you're using. So visible light goes from something like 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers and so you're not going to be able to see anything smaller than about 400 nanometers say inside of a cell or outside of the cell with your microscope um, and so people like to to use electrons to make electron microscopes because the wavelength of those electrons is just so darn small um, 
and so that allows you to see all these fine details. So if you go onto Google and you search for electron microscope images, you'll see all these incredibly interesting uh, pictures. And, and the reason that you can see those things is because the wavelength is, is so darn small, which allows you to resolve very fine details. Um, now this is kind of a convention thing. So there's two versions of Planck's constant. Uh, we've already talked about the first one, which is just Planck's constant, 6.6 um, .6 times 10 to minus 34. There's another version that's, that is the same but different. It's just divided by two. So for some reason in physics, this is not my idea, people. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, in physics, it turns out that very often you have Planck's constant divided by two pi. And it happens often enough that physicists got so lazy that they decided to define something called h bar, uh, which is a little h that has a line on top. I don't know if you guys can see the line there, but there's a line on top of the h. Um, and so this is uh, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So that is going to pop up occasionally and just try not to be um, confused by that. Uh, so that's your public service announcement for today. All right, the last thing to talk about is quantum tunneling, which is a pretty interesting phenomenon. So, so let's, I, I like to explain it like this. So let's say you're trying to throw a basketball over some sort of a tall barrier and but it's very tall and you're throwing it you're throwing it you're throwing it and it just won't go over and you don't quite have the arm strength to get it over the top um, well if you do that each time that ball is going to end up back back on the ground right and no matter how many times you try it if you don't have the arm strength to get over the top of that thing then there's just really no hope for for getting it over there um, so this this barrier lives up to its name of, of stopping whatever it is you're trying to get over it um, now imagine if instead of a basketball, instead you're going to throw an electron. And so maybe you call this electron cloud. Um, but you're going to throw an electron up there, and you throw it, and you throw it, and uh, you have detectors that can measure these things. And so you throw this thing, and uh, most of the time it's going to come back and register in this little detector there. I don't want to get into the details of how these things are detected, but it comes back and gets detected here. But it turns out that if you do this over and over and over again, um, eventually, sometimes, occasionally, uh, this thing will register that an electron has gotten through. Which is a little crazy because you didn't actually have the arm strength to get it, you know, the velocity to get over that barrier. Um, but it made it over there somehow anyway. Um, and this is one of this is another one of those weird things that happen. Um, so one way of interpreting this is to say that um, quantum mechanics allows particles to violate the conservation of energy um, as long as it is for a very short period of time. Um, we are in reality, we are not actually violating the conservation of energy. It's just that the particle wave nature of the electron uh, means that the electron cannot be purely localized anywhere. I mean, it's, it's likely to be, you know, close to the middle of this cloud or whatever, um, but it might be out here, it might be out here, and technically it could be out at the moon. It's just that that's, that possibility is, you know, e to the minus 100 or something like that. Um, and so, the particle wave nature of this electron means that it could show up anywhere around here. You can't uniquely define it to be here or here or here, and you can't uniquely define it to be 100% on this side of the barrier is the issue. And so at the end of the day, it's, it's as if, uh, it's, it's as if uh, conservation of energy can sort of be violated, uh, but just as long as it's a very short period of time. Now, why doesn't this work with the basketball? Well, thinking about this in terms of violating the conservation of energy, well, um, you can only borrow so much energy for such a period of time. And so for this to work for the basketball, um, you, would, you can only borrow so much energy to do it. And it's just too much energy that we take to get this basketball over the edge of the thing. But for the electron, um, it doesn't take nearly as much energy to get over that barrier, and so it becomes much more possible. So this process is called quantum tunneling. It's very weird, and um, again, it works better if the particle's mass is small because of this idea that we're, bor we're borrowing energy for, 
for some instant of time. Now you might think that this has no practical application or this is just some weird thing that that happens that I have to mention to you because I don't know, somebody said it was important. Um, but it turns out that this is the basis for radioactive decay. So inside of a nucleus, um, you have many, many protons and neutrons, right? So one of the ways that the nucleus can, de can decay is by emitting an alpha particle. Um, an alpha particle is just uh, two protons and two neutrons, and which is just a helium nucleus. And so imagine for the moment you have this big old nucleus, lots and lots of protons and neutrons, but inside of it, there's like a group of four uh, nucleons, two protons and two neutrons, it's sort of zipping back and forth together. And the only reason they're staying in that, in that nucleus is because of uh, nuclear forces, right? Because uh, it's, all those positive charges are repelling from each other. Like, well, why, are, why don't the protons just explode? Well, it's because these nuclear forces are holding them all together. And you can imagine this group of uh, four nucleons, two protons and neutrons, sort of zipping back and forth. Um, but every time they get too far, these nuclear forces bring them back in. And these nuclear forces are very, very strong. Um, and so it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so in terms of how much energy it would take to escape, um, there just isn't enough energy for this particle to get away from the nu nucleus because of those nuclear forces. Um, but if it does it enough times and for long enough, there's a chance that it could borrow just enough energy to get out. Um, and so this process is very much like the process of like, you know, the basketball going over the barrier, the electron going over the barrier. The only difference is that we're talking about nuclear forces instead of like gravity trying to hold this thing back. Um, but otherwise it's, it's exactly the same. And so when one of these, uh, one of these alpha particles escapes from the nucleus, um, that's a radioactive decay. And so that nucleus has two fewer protons and two fewer neutrons, and it becomes a different atom, different element. Um, and then the, the alpha particle goes streaming away because as soon as it gets away from that, uh, the, the nuclear forces, then that electrical repulsion uh, allows it to, to, be, to go up to high energies to move away. And what's interesting is that um, for, you know, that some, some elements have very long half-lives. So uranium, for example, has a half-life of something like a billion years. Um, so they, I think it's uranium-238, I believe, has a half-life of, of over a billion years. And, and so it's very unlikely to decay. Um, but if you wait long enough, if you wait a billion years, uh, then, then at, at some point in that billion years, it becomes fairly likely for it to, to decay or at least it becomes, you know, 50% probability that it would decay on that time scale. And so even though these things are zipping around, zipping around, zipping around, there's just barely enough of a chance that it can get through that, that eventually it does. Um, whereas other elements, uh, it's the same process happening, but, uh, but maybe the nuclear forces are not quite as strong, and uh, that there are things that have half-lives of uh, 14 years or five minutes or 10 minutes. Like there's, there's all kinds of radioactive isotopes that have relatively short-lived half-lives as well. And it all depends on exactly what those nuclear force it is, forces it is. It depends on what kind of particle it's trying to tunnel out. Um, but again, the process, uh, the process is the same and it's a quantum mechanical process. Um, so, so this is all under the category of uh, radioactive decay of things sort of coming apart um, does it also apply to nuclear fusion, which is things coming together? Um, so let's, let's talk about that for a moment. So let's say that you're trying to achieve nuclear fusion, and so you have uh, particles in a gas, and you're trying to get these particles to slam up against each other as best as you can. So we did this coating activity that you probably remember. Um, we tried it, you know, I'm holding one of those particles fixed, and the other particle comes in and then repels. In reality, they're all going to be moving around, and you're still trying to get them to collide, but uh, for simplicity, I just kept one fixed, and the other one was coming in. Um, and so as the particle is coming in, um, so this is the, the charge of the incoming particle. Uh, the larger the charge, the more of the repulsion force there. Um, I'm not going to think so much about what's, you know, this target particle that's held fixed. Let's, let's imagine that that's fixed for a moment. Um, and so what really matters is what is the charge of the incoming particle 
uh, and what is the mass of the incoming particle. Uh, and even more important than that, what is the ratio of those two things, the charge to mass ratio, because the smaller this ratio, um, then the less the acceleration, right? So if I have, if this is the, the target particle and the other particles coming in, uh, if it accelerates less, it's likely to get much closer to this thing before it turns around and goes the opposite way. That turns out to be true whether this thing is fixed or whether it's not. Um, the, the smaller the charge to mass ratio, the, you know, the less charge, the more mass, um, then uh, the, the, the easier it is to get those things to, to smash into each other because the, re the repulsive acceleration is, is so much smaller. So, so that's what makes for ideal uh, fus fusion conditions. And typically when we're doing fusion, um, we're typically using isotopes of hydrogen. So the sun likes to use these, this isotope of hydrogen, which is regular hydrogen, which is just a hydrogen nucleus, one proton. Um, uh, and then there's uh, deuterium, which is present in heavy water. And so in heavy water, you have uh, D2O instead of H2O. So these things are chemically bonded with an oxygen. And then you have tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. So the, the atomic mass is three. Um, and typically when you read about fusion experiments uh, in the newspaper, um, you're reading about one of these three elements doing the fusion. And so the question is what, which one of these would work the best for fusion fuel according to the previous slide? Well, the previous slide argued that Q over M is, is the most important. And so, so they all have the same Q, right? So they're all positively charged. But this one has a mass of one, and this one has a mass of three, so the charge and mass ratio is a third. Um, it turns out that uh, when you go and read the read about people doing fusion, um, it talks about that this combination, deuterium and tritium, turns out to be the best fusion fuel. And in any hydrogen bomb that's ever been made, or any um, any uh, sort of magnetic fusion experiment that people are trying to do. They always use deuterium and tritium. Um, I think I just said all these things. Now here's something interesting, which is that why is it deuterium and tritium that makes the best fusion fuel and not tritium tritium, right? Because if you had tritium here and tritium here and you're trying to get those two things to fuse, well, they both have a charge of one um, but they both have a mass of three, and so their charge to mass ratio uh, is the lowest of all of these different options, right? It, you know, deuterium, deuterium, well, you can try to do that and maybe succeed at it, uh, but the charge to mass ratio is, uh, you know, one charge uh, plus one and then a mass of two, and so your charge to, to mass ratio is not going to be quite as good as, as tritium. So why not just use tritium, tritium? Why do, why do deuterium and tritium, why does that end up being the best fusion fuel instead of just using tritium and tritium? Um, and the answer is kind of interesting, which is that uh, the quantum tunneling that I've been talking about depends on what the mass of the particle is. And the quantum tunneling works better the lower the mass of the particles, which is why quantum tunneling works better for, um, you know, all, all these quantum mechanic eff effects are, are, are larger for lighter weight particles. So electrons are one example, um, but also deuterium is an example. Because remember I said earlier that all, all particles have a way of nature. So it's not just electrons, it's protons, it's neutrons, it's deuterons, deuterium, also has a, has a, a way of nature. Um, and so, uh, there's a kind of a barrier for this dude for this deuterium this deuteron to collide with and uh, interact closely with this tritium ion um, But it's there's this repulsive force because they're both positively charged and It turns out that it's better to use uh, deuterium which is lighter based on the possibility that will tunnel into the tritium than it is to use tritium and tritium because tr tritium and tritium is heavier and it's less likely to do that tunneling to overcome that last step of getting the two things to fuse. Um, 
So that's the reason why tritium tritium is not the best fuel. It's because what turns out to be the best is, is using deuterium for the possibility that, that it will tunnel into the tritium. Um, it's just there's just no way of getting these experiments hot enough for them to for the for things to fuse without using uh, the insert without using uh, quantum tunneling to try to achieve it. So this is an equation from the book. Here's our h bar. I promised you there was going to be h bar here. So this is just Planck's constant divided by two pi. They're a little bit lazy. They could have put the two pi out here, but um, so this is the uh, this is sort of the, I forget what this is called, the transmission probability of something going through uh, a barrier. So this is our deuteron. Um, there's some sort of barrier there. Um, so this is the transmission probability and there's, there's this coefficient here. Now, the wider that this barrier is, well then, um, you know, C is positive here, right? Because it's square root, this is positive. So the, the larger the delta x hit, is here, then the less likely that this thing is is going to get through the barrier. Um, um, but an interesting thing is that uh, the less massive that this thing is, the smaller that M is, then the smaller that C is, and the smaller that C is, the closer that this thing gets to zero, let's say, and e to the zero is the transmission probability of one. Um, and so it helps to have lower mass if you're trying to get through a barrier like this. Now, where does the factor of two come from? Um, if you look in the book, this comes from the fact that I said earlier that we're squaring the wave function. So when you square something that uh, puts you know, a factor of two in the exponent there. And so that's why we're defining this as uh, e to the minus two c delta x instead of just sticking, defining c to be twice this. Um, but in any case, this is this is how you do it, um, and uh, that's right. Now, if you have enough kinetic energy, right? So if the kinetic energy is equal to the to the energy of the barrier, well then this is zero, right? C is equal to zero, zero times zero, and the transmission probability is one. And so if you have enough kinetic energy, you can get through this. Um, but if you have something less than the kinetic energy of this barrier. There's still a chance you can get through this, but it's it's very much suppressed by this e to the minus whatever you got there. So um, so just to kind of review, uh, radioactive decay is the inverse process of fusion. So instead of having things come together, uh, it's things coming apart. And in fusion, uh, this quantum tunneling is very important for uh, getting those reactions to happen. Um, whereas with radioactive decay, it's, it's all about uh, tunneling out of the nucleus in spite of uh, the nuclear forces. With fusion, it's, t it's sort of tunneling, tunneling into the nucleus in spite of the electrostatic repulsion. So that's about all I have for the day. There's an interesting worksheet that I can tell you about. Um, so this worksheet is very much uh, related to, uh, if you go back all the way to lecture seven, Lecture seven talks about um, you know buying a dental X-ray machine off of eBay and using that to accelerate uh, charged particles and trying to figure out exactly how close do these particles get. Um, so this time we have a target particle that we're going to hold fixed um, just for our own sanity, but we're going to appreciate that the proton has some sort of wavelength to it, and so we're going to try to to figure out uh, how much overlap we're gonna get with this target in the hopes that we can uh, produce fusion here. Now, I've, I've mainly emphasized uh, deuterium-tritium fusion in my lecture, um, but there's another kind of fusion that is uh, proton-boron fusion. Um, and so, yeah, so it talks about boron here. I didn't make that up. This is a real fusion situation. I read a news article about people trying to do proton-boron fusion the other day. Um, and so this is a real thing, but the important thing is for our purposes is that the boron is much heavier than the proton, which means that it's slightly more understandable that we're just going to sort of keep that still and let the proton just sort of approach it and not have to worry about the fact that in real life this thing would, would get at least somewhat, some amount of, of, of uh, velocity going the other way. So the idea again is, is trying to figure out how close to overlapping can we get this thing and you'll find that um, the proton that has the largest wavelength um, is, is somewhat more likely to, uh, to interact with the boron. 
So anyway, I hope that you enjoy this worksheet. I, I think it's kind of interesting twist on, on what we've been doing. So, all right, well, thanks for watching everybody. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys at the next uh, check-in. Thanks.